Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm just curious, how did most of you hear about uh, the talk? Was it on the mailing list here or? OK, OK. All right, well, thank you so much. You obviously know what, uh, what we're here to talk about. And uh, so why am I here? Um, you know, I'm here for lots of different reasons. Obviously, I want to raise awareness and mostly educate. Um, and I want to say nothing that I'm going to tell you, even though you know it might be controversial to some people. I'm not here to uh, offend. I'm not here to convince you of anything. I'm just trying to present information. And uh, I'm going to be sharing my personal journey, uh, which I started on more than 30 years ago. And um, I want to give you hope that we do have a, a roadmap to manifest a new normal. It doesn't have to be this way. It hasn't always been this way. And you know what? We are definitely not here to bash men either. We love our men. And sometimes I know uh, when I go out and give talks, because we're talking about the sacred feminine, you know, sometimes people jump to the erroneous conclusion that this is an anti-male talk, and it really isn't. And we'll get into that later. And um, I'm going to, you know, talk about why things are the way they are, you know, from what I've learned in this 30-year um, journey. But what I really want to get across is how we can heal, how we can change it, how we can change our mindset, our values, recognize hidden traumas, abuse, that sort of thing, uh, so that we can shed light on them, heal, move on, be whole. Um, so I just ask you to uh, have an open heart, an open mind, and uh, hold your questions to the end. And, uh, and I think Billy already said to turn off uh, the devices. Uh, so a little bit uh, about myself. You can see some of my book covers there. Uh, I do have some books uh, for sale uh, if, if you're interested. And um, some of the things that uh, Billy didn't say is, at one point along this journey of discovering the sacred feminine, my wonderful husband, Roy, who's back there, Roy, <laughs> raise your hand. Um, we've been married almost 40 years. Um, we started um, a, the, you know, before it was a thing to do, we started travels to sacred sites uh, of goddess around the world. And it was a little travel agency called a Special Journey Travel. Uh, I'm also a power of partnership presenter, uh, a caring economy conversation leader. Uh, my podcast has been on the air since 2009. And I don't even think they were called podcasts back then. I think they were actually called internet radio. So that's, you know, that's kind of cool. Uh, I've given talks at the American Academy of Religion and the Parliament for the World, you know, for world religions. Um, and um, for those of you who might not have been here earlier, we were talking about uh, the groups we have in Grants Pass, because that's where I live now. And uh, we have two women slash goddess-oriented events every month. One is the second Wednesday of the month. The other is the fourth Wednesday of the month. Uh, you're welcome to ask me about those or my friend Marie. Marie can raise her hand. She's here helping me tonight. Thank you, Marie. And uh, I also have an email sheet. So if uh, you want to keep in touch with me for any reason, you want to know about my work, you want to ask questions, you want to come to the events, whatever, I'll put your name on the email list. So, um, you know, I started out in New Orleans, Louisiana. <laughs> Uh, and it's been really a journey of discovery for me because I started out in the Bible Belt. And here I am, an ordained interfaith minister, and, you know, goddess is my thing. Uh, and so no one would have been more surprised than me that I'm here talking about this topic uh, for three decades. But in a way, you know, I kind of think I'm the perfect person to talk about it, one of the perfect people to talk about it, because I grew up uh, in the racist, sexist South, as I said, New Orleans to be specific, um, where this is not spoken about. Um, and, and I think even today, not a whole lot of people, you know, this isn't the topic of conversation. They may go their entire lives and never hear about it. And, um, you know, they're living their lives thinking everything is normal, uh, things have always been this way. Uh, you know, they never question anything. And they kind of endure. 
Maybe they don't even realize they're enduring. It's just normal, right? And I understand this because I lived it till I was almost 30. And, um, and I think another reason, um, you know, this is an important topic for me and maybe I'm a good person to deliver the message is because I grew up a racist. Everybody around me was a racist. People didn't question racism. It was just the thing, you know? It was our, our heritage, our culture, you know? And, and that's a really sorry thing to say, but I'm here to be honest with you today. And uh, I think it made us feel superior, you know? Um, but getting out of the bubble, um, you know, uh, you know, you educate yourself, you raise your awareness, and, um, you know, sort of filled in the gaps where hate uh, and enduring sexism once lived with values of, uh, of the sacred feminine. So, um, I started realizing I had questions, and uh, at least, uh, you know, some of the least of which were, uh, why doesn't God look like me? Why are suffering and sacrifice normalized, uh, even applauded, expected? We're told uh, we'll suffer and sacrifice and receive our everlasting reward sitting on the right hand of a male god, or we might get lucky if we're Mormon and the man in our life might invite us to live on his planet with us, right? Um, <laughs> um, and, and I started asking, well, what is, what is a feminine uh, face of God? You know, as a Catholic, we were allowed to uh, have the benign Mary, uh, as wonderful as she is, but, you know, she didn't rise to, to the level of God. And, um, you know, and she could birth a God, but she couldn't be equal to a God, right? Um, and why is sex taboo? Uh, why are some men so afraid of women's sexuality? Why are women made to be afraid or ashamed of their own sexuality? Uh, or we're told um, that there better not be pleasure in sex because sex is just, you know, f uh, for uh, procreation. Uh, and if we enjoy it, maybe we're going to go to hell. I mean, I was a Catholic, so I heard all of this stuff growing up, right? And, um, and then, you know, social, you know, social justice issues. Why should women obey men? Um, and, you know, we're told that there's God and there's men uh, and that everything else on the planet is there to serve God and man. Uh, so why is that? And you know what, when you think about it, what a sweet deal if you can get it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I want to make the point that you know, men have been conditioned in all these ideas too, but they have benefited from it, you know, and they have to be willing to admit that. Um, and um, let's see, and why do women make less money? Well, you know, they used to tell us uh, men were entitled to make uh, more money than men because men had to support families. Well, that, that doesn't fly anymore, right? And uh, where are the women in history? Every Women's History Month, you know, rolls around and we realize, sure, there's a lot, you know, but nowhere near as much uh, out there in the world uh, by women as there is by men. So where are the women in history? And, um, you know, and why are things so out of balance? Uh, is this normal? And was it always this way? And I started to get some answers to those questions. And I started to realize, uh, thanks to my mentors, um, you know, uh, I started to get answers to some of these questions. And I invite you to invest in yourself and consider reading uh, some of the authors that I'm about to tell you about. Uh, they're scholars, social scientists, theologians, gender studies experts. Uh, their research isn't in mainstream educational systems unless you take college classes, uh, if they're available at your school, because even less and less now we're finding fewer and fewer gender studies, women's studies. Uh, if you have it, you're lucky, uh, because it's not everywhere. Um, Glad, I think here at SOU, I think you do have uh, gender studies and women's studies, so you're, you're lucky. 
But um, Rianne Eisler, I, I really do credit her. Uh, I think if it had not been for her work, I would maybe not be on this path, who knows. Uh, but her seminal work was probably Chalice and the Blade. Uh, maybe you've heard of Chalice and the Blade. If, if you don't remember anything else I say tonight, get yourself a copy of Chalice and the Blade and read it and then contact me, <laughs> you know, because I think it'll change your life. I mean, it, it, it did, it changed my life. I learned about matriarchies and egalitarian societies going back more than 40,000 years. 40,000 years. I did say 40,000 years. Uh, Merlin Stone was another one. She wrote When God Was a Woman. Uh, Carol Christ uh, was incredible. Uh, she's not with us anymore. Um, I'll mention her later, but she was a woman who dared, dared, dared to take a spot in seminary that could have been filled by a man, and they never let her live that down. They said, why are you wasting time that a man could fill this spot because you're just going to go home and get married and have babies? But she didn't. Uh, Monica Sue, uh, cosmic, who wrote Cosmic Mother, she connected the dots between patriarchy and capitalism. Joseph Campbell, you know, who we all know. Maria Gimbutas, um, reviled, then vindicated, you know. Um, Male-dominated archaeology rejected her work. And, um, un, but not that long ago, through DNA studies, she was vindicated. So even some fiction books out there shed light on what life was like before uh, male dominated, uh, males dominated or uh, patriarchy took hold. I think about the Red Tent, I think about the Mists of Avalon, for instance, uh, Mary, uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley. So uh, patriarchy, male-dominated society and culture was not always a thing, obviously. You read Chalice and the Blade, you know there were matriarchies, there were egalitarian societies. Um, you know, patriarchy is, uh, hasn't always been that way because there wasn't always a male god. A male god is a relatively new construct. Uh, egalitarian societies were where women and wi men were more equal. Uh, matriarchies, um, and, and a lot of them where assets were passed down from mother to daughter. Uh, women didn't have to marry, uh, where goddess was, uh, goddesses were revered. Um, in fact, some remnants can still be found in the world today, and it's not patriarchy in a skirt either, you know. Um, some of the Native American tribes are at actually matriarchies. Herstory. That's kind of a, you know, a new word that we had to coin rather than history. History is about the feminine face of God. It's about women's history, the part they played, maybe discovering ag agriculture, you know, everything women contributed to society that we don't learn about because they're an afterthought, you know, in patriarchy. Um, the dominator pyramid is something that you would uh, find out about in Rian Eisler's work because with the Dominator Pyramid you have, you know, the people up at the top that are calling all the shots for the rest of us down, uh, down at the bottom, uh, dominating basically the rest of us. Um, not that long ago we were here in the 1% versus the 99%. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, the pyramid is about economics, it's about religion, it's about culture. Who are the gatekeepers that hold the power and control or dominate the rest of us? That's the dominator pyramid. Um, so the divine, oh, and uh, also authoritarian religions, uh, you know, male-dominated religions, created man-made religious dogma coupled with capitalism, creates sexism, racism, environmental exploitation, uh, and classism. And, um, you know, each of these could be a talk in themselves, but we don't have time to go into all of that. I'm just trying to give you kind of a thumbnail sketch, maybe some things you want to go home and research if you haven't heard about it, or maybe, you know, you want to know more. So why are we talking about this? Well, I think 
it's important to talk about this because we want to restore balance in all aspects of our world, economically, spiritually, politically, culturally, and our society. We want a new normal, uh, one of oneness, diversity, equality, justice. We want to evolve as humans, you know. Um, some talk about ascension or maybe vibrating on a higher level or frequency. Um, I don't know if, you know, those are those things mean anything to you, but think of it as we want to stop the hate and the division, you know. Um, and again, the, you know, this isn't about male bashing. You know, the, the goal of this talk is about recognizing and healing trauma. Uh, we want to learn our history and history, what's been missing from our, our stories, our education, and figure out why it was omitted. Who did it serve to omit things in you know, our educational systems? Uh, why was the divine feminine and feminine values marginalized or demonized? Why was female power thwarted at every turn? So. Again, you know, it's not about male bashing because men have been damaged too. They're just as brainwashed as women. And like I said, they've just, you know, they were lucky to benefit from the system. So um, there are antidotes to the trauma. Uh, we can heal the wounded feminine in women and men. And there are signposts for us to follow uh, to get beyond all this. So um, one of the, just one, this, this talk is not just about the divine feminine, but I'm going to kind of tackle that first. Um, we have to know what's missing. You know, the pendulum swung from the feminine to the masculine, and we need to know what we missed in the feminine in order to restore balance and come back to the center, uh, to a balance point. So I want to read something. <coughs> real quick from my Walking Ancient Path book. The sacred feminine, whether an archetype, an ideology, or a heavenly deity that rules the fates of humankind, the world has been wounded from her absence, much like a child growing up without a mother. Humans are in chaos and disharmony in part because the feminine face of God has been stripped from too many of our cultures also religions and psyches. We are like children with an emptiness in our heart that will not heal, and we compensate in ways that have had tragic consequences for humankind. The dogma of human-made patriarchal religion professing the only valid truth is revering a monotheistic male god has attempted to dethrone goddess from her place as creatrix of the world for thousands of years. People resisted. <clears throat> they changed the names of goddess to Mary, Mary Magdalene, Kuan Yin, Guadalupe, or some called her St. Bridget. They built grand cathedrals in her name, but we're starting to remember the roots and true origins of the divine feminine. She's not a fantasy. Evidence her lives in museums, art, textiles, parables, myths, and archeological sites if we just seek her out, if we know to seek her out. She's the missing piece of the puzzle that can lend harmony and guidance to issues of power, war, and politics. She sheds light on the meaning of love, life, and death. She brings us a mother's unconditional love, or tough love, and inspires us with hope. She embodies the laws of duality, polarity, multiplicity, reciprocity, and attraction, right action, and justice, or her credos. So, I want to pass these out uh, just to kind of give, if, give you an example of how old the sacred feminine is. Uh, this is called the goddess timeline from different parts of the world. Now, there are three different ones, so I'll, I'll, whoops, I'll send one uh, down each row. And the people on the front row maybe can grab them at the end and figure out for how we can have you see all of them. So um, science has proven the divine feminine worship goes back 45,000 years, possibly 200,000 years. If we look at artifacts from Israel, uh, namely uh, one called the Birkat Ram or the Acheulean goddess, 
You can see a Venus figurine found in France um, on the slide up there, up at the top. Um, she's probably about this big. She's, she's that small. She's, she's so beautiful. Um, people were worshiping a female god long before a male god because they believed women were magical. They could bleed without dying every month, right? They gave birth. Um, they created new life, just like the earth created new life and everything we needed to sustain ourselves. And um, we also believe now, um, you know, I'm sure some people can test it, but we also believe that women, if they didn't create civilization, they had a really strong hand in it. Uh, because rather than patriarchy's narrative that women are breeders, Madonnas, whores, the weaker sex, uh, using our biology against us to relegate us to the home um, so that we're not, uh, you know, in a decision-making capacity, um, anthropologists actually believe that women invented agriculture, uh, animal husbandry, pottery, spinning, weaving. Uh, they saw the mystery of life uh, in the transformation of seed to plant, to harvested crop, or how the clay comes from the ground and becomes a fired pot, wool and flax uh, to thread, uh, to spin cloth. This was magical you know, back in the earliest days. And women were doing that work, right? So they held a lot of power. Um, anthropologists and sociologists tell us um, that um, where goddess was revered, we had a higher status of women. Uh, examples in uh, pre-Islamic Egypt was Isis. Her symbol is the throne. And it was through her authority, the pharaoh got the right to rule. You know, he just couldn't take it. She had to give him the right to rule. And you'll see her on um, carvings where she's handing the pharaoh um, uh, an, an image in her hand of another goddess called Ma'at, which is right action and justice. So she's saying, I'll give you the right to rule, but you got to do right by the people. Um, you know, when in Egypt, for instance, you know, women could have businesses, they could divorce their husbands, they didn't have to submit to male authority. Um, also, I think goddess is a poster girl for inclusion and diversity. Because as you're looking at these things that are being passed around, she's across continents and cultures. She's different colors, she's different shapes, she's um, you know, there's not one image of goddess. So by virtue of that, she of 10,000 names, probably so many more than 10,000 names across continents and cultures over thousands of years, she becomes, um, you know, diversity herself, inclusion. Uh, also, there was uh, a reverence for the sacredness of life and connections to nature. Um, you know, when you get into uh, the divine feminine. These societies uh, had high art, egalitarian so societal structures. A lot of times, no fortifications were needed. They did, weren't warring people. Metals weren't used for weapons. Metals were used for, for sacred objects. Ideas like the common good um, you know, was, was primary in Minoan Crete. The extra money and resources that uh, the city-state had went to the common good. Uh, and there was also fe uh, female leadership. You know, the Iroquois here in North America influenced the formation of the Constitution. Navajo practiced matriarchy, passing assets down uh, the mother line from mother to daughter. And it was important because women and children then were kept at the center of the tribe, and they didn't suffer economic hardship at the end of a marriage or a love relationship. In fact, in matriarchy's marriage wasn't even a thing. It didn't, didn't mean anything like it does in patriarchy. So the divine feminine, um, you know, when I talk about it, she's, you can look at her from, you know, it's like the layers of an onion. You can believe she's a deity that resides in the heaven, if you like, but I know some people think that's anti-intellectual. You can look at her as a role model or archetype, or you can look at what her ideals are. And if you look at her ideals, um, it's interesting because 
you know, if you're into the idea of ascension and vibrating at a higher frequency, it's her values, you know, they coincide, you know, sacred feminine values or the values you would incorporate in your life um, as a vehicle for ascension. Uh, but all, uh, all that is, but all that is lost in the coming patriarchy and accompanying domination, suppression, uh, and marginalization happened. So, uh, but it didn't happen overnight. Theories abound as to why it happened. Um, you have God and church taking over the role of women and goddess. Athena is birthed from Zeus's head. Um, or goddesses are downgraded from a goddess who created the world to just some god's wife. Um, Eve comes from Adam's rib now, you know. Uh, church leaders like uh, the Christian church leader Tertullian said, uh, women are just incubators for the sacred male seed. Uh, women have to submit to male authority. Myths like Pandora arose, um, which have women being accused of unleashing the ills of society upon the world. Uh, women and female agency became demonized and uh, marginalized. You think about Lilith, Adam's first wife, um, who just wanted autonomy. Well, she becomes a demon or a succubus, right? Uh, the Garden of Eden myth, uh, Merlin Stone said she thought it was, was one of the earliest pieces of political propaganda uh, because it gave license and excuse to make women endure suffering for Eve's sin. Uh, Hera, uh, Hera, another creatrix goddess, universal goddess, now she's just some uh, petulant wife chasing after her philandering husband, um, you know, um, Zeus, and Aphrodite, well, you know, she's relegated to, she's just the boudoir babe now, right? <laughs> she's just about sex. Uh, patriarchy um, does allow uh, benign females like Mary, the mother of Jesus. No offense, Mary's wonderful, I was a Catholic, but she's pretty benign. Um, we can have goddesses of war. Uh, goddesses who can control nature so we don't suffer economic disaster, but women can't have powerful goddess archetypes or role models that portray female autonomy, courage, strength, or leadership. Uh, patriarchal gods begin to defeat goddess as creatrix of the world and, and uh, goddesses who support women. And as the myths change, so does society change. One person's myth is another religion or way of life. Uh, we had gender side, is what I like to call the witch burnings. Uh, female healers, midwives, herbalists, widows with property, perhaps women who danced to their own drummer and didn't want to submit to men, become targets and, um, you know, uh, you know, and then you had the up-and-coming uh, male-dominated uh, cottage industry of doctors and inquisitioners. So they were in competition with these men. Um, women were relegated to the home. Uh, they're breeders, they're wearing burkers, they aren't educated, or may maybe educated enough so that they can read a recipe, right? Uh, their sexuality is controlled. Remember chastity belts? Um, why? A lot of it had to do with male inheritance um, and assets. Uh, monotheistic patriarchal religions uh, or the dominator pyramid, well, you know, uh, common ground that people used to use to sustain themselves and feed their families, grow crops, you know, sh you know, shoot or catch animals for food, well, that became the property of the wealthy landowner. So that pushed the people who were living off the land, off Mother Earth, off Gaia, into the cities to become wage slaves. Um, and, you know, and we know patriarchy needs an underclass to thrive. So these are complicated subjects, right? And I'm just kind of giving you um, kind of a, a, a brief thumbnail. Um, so the idea of the common good gets lost um, with the idea of the common ground. And um, so what does that look like today when we lose the common good? Well, it's the 1% versus the 99%. You know, you have billionaires bribing the Supreme Court. 
and all the rest, right? Um, you know, rich billionaires who have so much money, they can build spaceships and go to the moon. Um, and, uh, you know, when everyday average people, well, you know, we're fighting for the scraps at the bottom of the heap. And um, we accept and we normalize abuse. Uh, without a good uh, education, oftentimes we vote against our economic interests and put the wrong people in office who really don't care much about us. That's, um, that's my latest book, and uh, because I, I started to realize through things I was going through in my own life, even though I considered myself a social justice activist, even I was wearing blinders to a lot of the abuse and exploitation that I just accepted as normal. And I really took a deep dive and thought, you know, we gotta look at this. We can't keep thinking that um, this is all normal. Because you know what, it's not normal. It's abuse, it's exploitation, and we have to call it what it is. Um, oh, you know, a simple example. Think of a non-disclosure agreement, right? Um, it used to just be something, you know, benign that maybe if you went and worked for a company, you signed a non-disclosure agreement because um, you know, you weren't supposed to share the company secrets. Well, that's cool, but what do evil men do when they want to hide the dirty deeds they do? Mm -hmm. They make us sign a non-disclosure agreement and we can't talk, mm -hmm. and we don't have the money to fight it mm -hmm. in court, you know? Mm -hmm. Even if they had no right to make us sign that non-disclosure, they probably have more money than we do to fight it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's just one example. The book actually goes into all different areas where we're normalizing abuse and exploitation from uh, the government, military, religion, society, culture, the workplace, uh, family and friends, um, you know, it, practically every a academia, practically every aspect of our life has abuses and exploitation that we don't even see anymore as abuse and exploitation. And that's in, in, the, in the part of the book where I'm pointing it out, um, you know, I go into, you know, a lot of that, but then toward the end, you know, we talk about, okay, so, you know, we're not just here to gripe about it, what can we do about it, right? Um, I want to read just a little bit uh, from Normalizing Abuse. So um, I, I won't read them all, but there's a, a page in here called 21 Injustices of Sexism, Domestic Violence and Sexual Abuse, Female Genital Mutilation, 70% of women retire in poverty because they've made less than men all their life. Uh, 63 cents on the dollar, I think, if you're black or brown, maybe 70 or 80 cents. I forget what it is now if you're white. Women's leadership is thwarted. While being the majority, there's less than 20% representation by women in Congress, uh, high levels of corporate America, religious institutions, and academia. Uh, women and children are at the margins of societies the world over, suffering from the worst health care, education, and human rights. Bride burning and arranged marriages still exists. Women may be shunned from families or seem uh, to bring shame to their family if they have been raped or believed to have committed adultery. Tragic consequences for them can include being stoned to death. <coughs> There's a distorted view of women and sexuality resulting in an obsessive and unhealthy, unhealthy pornography industry. Women are being duped by the new feminism that encourages submissiveness and dependence. Have you seen some of these guys on the internet? They, they actually put these conferences together about the new feminism and they invite women to come because they're gonna teach them what men want so that they can get a husband. Yeah. And really it just turns into conditioning women to please them, mm -hmm. right? Not, it's not about their autonomy or their dreams or their desires. Mm -hmm. uh, there's human trafficking, slavery and forced prostitution. Uh, women are taught grounds for divorce might be abandonment or adultery but not abuse. J.D. Vance, we have him on film talking about um, women should have to stay in marriages that are abusive for the children. Go look it up, it's him, it's not AI. <clears throat> um, boy children are valued uh, while female babies are killed at birth in poor countries because they may cost the family a marriage dowry later on. 
Uh, sexuality is dirty and unclean and by association, so too were women, menstruation, and female reproduction. You know, there's a great documentary out there right now called Shiny Happy People. So you, you think this is just happening in some obscure part of the world, um, or you think it's not here in the United States, or maybe this was 50 years ago. Please look at shiny, uh, uh, shiny Happy People. It's about the Christian extremist group that the Duggars that were on TV were in. And um, it, it's, really, it's really a shame uh, because um, they talk about the fact that, you know, since you know, men and women are brought up to think sexuality is dirty and unclean and just for reproduction, men never learn about pleasing their wives. Wives never, never learn that they should expect or want pleasure. So can you imagine the marriage bed? I mean, it's, you know, they say that it's tantamount to, to rape, potentially, because they, heaven forbid, they can't enjoy it, right? Um, women are still in danger of losing, uh, uh, I mean, I wrote this a few years ago, and, uh, and we hadn't lost Roe v. Wade yet. Women are still in danger of losing access to contraception uh, it, and uh, are threatened with losing access to control their reproductive health. A distorted view of beauty has millions of women with eating disorders and flocking to cosmetic surgeons. And think of all the money spent in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, rape is a weapon of war. I mean, I, I can go on and on here, okay? But these are things, you know, these are just some examples. I mean, these are more blatant aspects of abuse and exploitation. And, you know, I'm not trying to sell the book, but you'd probably be amazed all the things in here that we just accept as, oh, that's just the way it is. And when you really look at it, you know, it's abuse uh, and exploitation. Um, let's see, so we're going to go on here. So, um, our beloved men are damaged by patriarchy too. Uh, there's toxic masculinity. I don't know, in my opinion, we saw it on stage at the Republican convention last week. Um, men, just like women, uh, maybe can't be their authentic selves, you know? Uh, military and sports condition men to abuse their bodies, to push it past the limits, you know, that when maybe they should stop. So if you think about that, um, so why not abuse women's bodies too, right? Um, it's the conditioning. Uh, we're also brainwashed by man-made religious dogma, but as I said, unfortunately, men benefit from it, and some jump on the bandwagon and take advantage of it where others have morality and ethics. Um, We've been convinced that values of the feminine are weak and women's bodies and cycles are dangerous. Um, anybody here has heard of the menstrual hut? I, I, I've seen your head shaking uh, up and down as I speak. The menstrual hut is a thing that's really out there in the world today. Uh, women are seen as unclean when they're on their period. Uh, it, there's so much superstition and mythology around women's bodies and shame around our, uh, you know, our cycles that women are actually forced to go to a menstrual hut away from their families, away from society, because they're unclean. Uh, some societies believe that if they walk across a f you know, field of crops while they're on their period, the crops will die, right? I mean, it's crazy shit, <laughs> but, it, but it's real. I mean, and it happens today. Um, uh, uh, burkas, right? Uh, women have to cover themselves up because man can't control their libidos. Dean, I say more. Um, so we, you know, and, um, you know, they value domination or power over rather than partnership. And the sacred feminine is about power with, not power over, not domination. It's about partnership. It's about collaboration. And so, um, there's four legs to the stool of patriarchy. And you can maybe just remember this. I don't know if it means anything to you. Sexism, racism, classism, environmental explo uh, uh, exploitation. 
that holds the stool of patriarchy up. And look, don't get me wrong, there are women that support patriarchy. So there are a lot of messed up women too because they want to be on the side of power, right? Um, medical establishment invests more money into men's health than understanding women's bodies and women's cycles. I mean, they know about those blue pills, right? Mm -hmm. But ask them about fibroids in women. Mm -hmm. Millions of women get fibroid tumors. Mm -hmm. They have no idea why, mm -hmm. okay? They haven't invested enough money to find out why. It's just not important. So, we do have signposts um, that will help us heal the physical, emotional, and, and uh, the psychological. And uh, embracing feminine values uh, is one way. Uh, but remember, the feminine values had been marginalized. And you see a lot of the feminine values written there on the side. Now, you know, the Dalai Lama said it would be Western women that would save the world. And um, I don't know, that kind of made me scratch my head. Um, I know he probably meant that because Western women had more access to money and uh, had more access in general. But knowing about the evil women out there that prop up patriarchy, I went, mm. and so I thought, you know what? This is really about the values of the sacred feminine, not a gender, mm -hmm. because men can just as easily embody these healthy values, and it has nothing to do with a vagina or a penis, mm -hmm. right? Nothing at all. Mm -hmm. It's a mindset. So, um, you know, think about how the world would be different if we embraced and uplifted these values and practiced them rather than think, you know, it's just not that way. I mean, it starts with each one of us, right? Um, and you can read them there. I'm not going to take the time to read them. Okay. So, do we even recognize the signs and symptoms um, of being wounded or traumatized? You know? Uh, that's why I wrote Normalizing Abuse, as I started to say, because I realized that I had been wearing blinders and I wasn't seeing the toxic in my own life. And I thought, what the hell? If I'm blind to some of this, what about people who have never heard about any of this? How hard would it be for them to wake up to the abuse and exploitation if I know about patriarchy and you know, all of these things we've been talking about, and I'm letting it happen in my own life. So, you know, we endure for a paycheck or to keep the peace, uh, or maybe because uh, we don't have healthy boundaries because we were never told to have healthy boundaries. In that documentary I mentioned, Shiny Happy People, they talked about blanket training. What they do is they put a child at six months old on a blanket, and put a toy that it likes just within reach, they know the baby's going to reach for the toy. So what do they do? They slap the baby. And they do it over and over and over and over again until the baby stops reaching. Okay? You know, um, think about that as you're going through life. You stop reaching. Yeah. Um, they even talked about how um, young women and young men, because, you know, the men, have learned, you know, this is a male-dominated society, they, they can take what they want, and the women haven't learned any healthy boundaries. They talk about uh, some of these women they talked to who were in this, you know, um, uh, you know, fundamentalist Christian group. They said, um, you know, they went to conferences and the boys were in one dormitory and the girls were in another, and the boys, you know, slowly made their way over to the girls, and the girls didn't even have the language to say no when these boys tried to, you know, sexually assault them. They didn't, no, they could say no. They didn't know how to say no because they had, 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 you know, healthy boundaries conditioned out of them. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a group today, the Duggar people, mm -hmm. right? And how many more of those same types of groups are all around the country? Dominionism. Dominionism made it into the White House and the Trump administration. In my radio show, I interviewed women in the Quiverful movement. 
who had escaped, and that was their word, they escaped the quiverful movement, they said that they were told that they were supposed to just keep having babies. And if it got to the point where their body just couldn't do it anymore, well, if they died, they were a martyr for Jesus. Mm. That was it. They were expendable. Mm. I mean, this is sick stuff, guys, you know, and we need to know this is happening out there. Um, okay, so um, we devalue ourselves. You know, we think we're not enough uh, when we really are, but we've been conditioned to think we're not enough. Um, we spend billions to achieve unattainable perfection. Uh, and we're like hamsters on a wheel, you know, tools of toxic people, toxic employers, the system. Uh, we spiritually bypass because we haven't learned emotional maturity. You know, we're uncomfortable with difficult or awkward situations, so rather than you know, jump in there and try to fix a situation. We just say, oh, let's throw love and compassion at it because we don't have the emotional maturity to be uncomfortable a little bit to work through a problem. Um, we accept abuse and exploitation as normal. It's just the way it is. Because, you know, we're like a fish in water. We no longer even see what we're swimming in, right? Um, we've had uh, shame about sex drilled into us uh, to the point for some uh, they've never learned about natural pleasure. Um, there's inst institutional, uh, institutional patriarchy continues. We're conditioned to endure. Think about Jesus on the cross, all right? As a Catholic, I went to Catholic school, went to church on Sundays, um, taught by nuns. We're taught to look at Jesus. We want to emulate Jesus. Jesus who was suffering, sacrificing, dying. Okay? Boy, that really sets a low bar for us, doesn't it? <laughs> if that's what we feel like we want to emulate in our life. They're teaching us from the very beginning to accept suffering and sacrifice. And you know, and, and when I and when I started thinking that way, I went, WTF, you know? <laughs> Um, okay, so we've set the bar really low, and when was the last time you asked someone or you were asked, how is your quality of life? Do you even think like that? I don't know, I don't think most of us do. How is your quality of life? And um, it wouldn't surprise me to learn that as a consequence, a lot of us have a happiness deficit. Because, you know, we've stopped reaching, you know? Next slide. All right, so um, I'm going to get back to the goddess a little bit. And I mentioned earlier on the theologian Carol Christ, uh, who passed away a couple years ago, but she was the one that was told that she was taking up space in the seminary, right? Well, um, she said that. Uh, in her teachings that uh, women needed the goddess for these four reasons. Um, goddess spirituality affirms uh, legitimacy and the beneficence of female power. It affirms the female body and life cycles expressed in it. It affirms a woman's will or power or achievement, and it reevaluates women's bonds and heritage. It encourages uh, sisterhood. And you know, we c you can really tell the character and values of a society by, by how it treats its poor, elderly, children, and women. And um, you know, we've already talked a bit about how anthropologists have studied societies and culture and say that a society or culture with a feminine face of God results in a society where women have higher status. So, um, again, Carol Chris, she contributed a lot to goddess spirituality. Um, she taught us these nine touchstones, values that we could live by, that we should um, nurture life, walk in love and beauty, trust the knowledge that comes through the body. I mean, think about that. We know when something's not right, mm -hmm. you know, in our gut, but we ignore it for all sorts of reasons. Um, we really need to speak the truth about conflict, pain, and suffering. That kind of goes back to 
uh, what I said before about spiritual bypass. We have to face conflict, pain, and suffering and do something about it, not just you know, bypass it or say, well, that's happening to somebody else. I got mine. Um, we should take only what we need. And in fact, there's a great goddess for that. She's called Sedna. She's an Inuit goddess that um, the people like around the icy waters of Newfoundland in Canada, um, they revere Sedna. And uh, I like to call her the environmental goddess too. I'm not gonna tell you her whole myth, just the gist of it here for the point I'm trying to make. Uh, she's like the gatekeeper of the animals in the sea. Now, you know, like the Alaskans, they depend on the animals in the sea for blubber and meat and eating. They you know, use their skin, their teeth, all of that. So Sedna says, okay, you can avail yourself of the animals of the sea, but you can't be greedy. If you take more than you need, you're cut off. You know, we really do have to get to the point where um, greed, we look at it as a sickness. You know, um, we need to think about consequences of our actions for seven generations. Mm -hmm. You know, if we did that, we wouldn't be drill, baby, drill, rape and frack the planet, would we? You know, we, we can't think for short term gain. Um, and we have to approach the taking of life with great restraint. Uh, we have to practice great generosity great generosity. There's even a goddess temple right outside of Las Vegas called the Sekhmet Temple. And uh, Genevieve Vaughan, who founded that temple, there's a magical story there. Uh, she was a wealthy woman who couldn't get pregnant. She went on uh, an, an expedition to Egypt. And she heard about this lion-headed Egyptian goddess called Sekhmet, who was a healer and a mother goddess. And she prayed to Sekhmet. She said, if you help me get pregnant, I'll build a temple for you. So after not being able to get pregnant for years, she came home and within a few months she was pregnant. So she stuck to her word and she built the Sekhmet temple. I think it's about 80 miles northwest of Las Vegas. But she started something called, um, um, I can't, uh, it, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's compassionate society, but it's also about generosity. In other words, for instance, you can go to the temple there and stay overnight, and they don't even charge you. You know, you give what you want. And this is about this idea of a mother's love. She doesn't put a price on it. It's about us having great generosity uh, to give what we can and only take what we need. And, you know, there's you know, it works out and there's enough for all. And it's also about repairing the web. You know, because if we really all are, you know, just one drop in the ocean or one thread of the cosmic web, everything that happens to Marie happens to me and happens to you. So we better repair that web because there's gonna be reverberations and it's gonna come back at us some way, somehow. So um, some other ways for us to heal, or let's restore awe and the wonders of life. Um, because when, you know, we, you know, when the settlers first came here to uh, the, you know, well, it wasn't the United States then, but when they came to North America, you know, they had this European uh, mindset and everything was a commodity. And if it wasn't a commodity, it was useless. Awe meant nothing to them. It was how can we make money off of it? But when you do that, awe disappears, right? And we really do need awe. We are starved for awe. Now, we're lucky. We live here in beautiful Oregon, right? We can go outside our door and we see awe. But not everybody can. Not everybody does. And when we restore awe, um, it, you know, it, it, sociologists, you know, psychologists have said it creates kindness, creativity, and calm. Also, um, we have to get back to the eight wonders of life, you know, which are uh, moral beauty, which is character, uh, of, you know, of virtue, collective effervescence, you know, collective energy, kind of like with that, you know, what you feel at a football game. Um, embracing nature, music, art, spirituality, mortality, epiphanies. Um, and you know, it makes me think when money's short in our public schools, what's the first thing that goes? Mm -hmm. 
Mu music and art, yeah. right? And we know now that music, art, sound, all of these things heal trauma, mm -hmm. you know, help us get through um, the difficulties of life. Um, or, you know, epiphanies, those are those um, magical aha moments, maybe those uh, divine downloads. Maybe we have to put more stock uh, in those things maybe being real. So um, signpost, you know, we want to strive to manifest a new normal. We can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome. Um, so these are just, you know, we'll just read down the list. You know, not to succumb to the patriarchal conditions I was talking about. Being versus having. Um, Eric Fromm, I didn't even, you know, learn this in God of Spirituality. He was a German psychologist from the 40s. Eric Fromm talked about, as humans, we have to stop thinking about what we have and don't have. You know, that's the keeping up with the Joneses mentality, right? Instead, it's like, who are we? Who are we being in the world? How do we serve humanity? How are we gen generous to our you know, fellow humans? What kind of being are we? Um, it's power with versus power over. You know, that's more of what we want in the new normal. Uh, normalizing alternative healing modalities that, you know, I just said, you know, sound and music and art. Uh, normalize self-care and, um, and mental health care. You know, I've just been reading the last few days, one of the reasons the mainstream media doesn't want to talk about Donald Trump's mental uh, capabilities is because it's taboo. It's taboo, okay? If we can't talk about it in a man that's maybe going to run the country, um, we have a problem as a society if we can't talk about it. Um, and just us, I mean, I know growing up in the South, people didn't go to psychiatrists or psychologists. It, I mean, it wasn't done, um, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, I don't I haven't lived there for a long time. It's probably better now. But there's still a taboo in some mm -hmm. circles around admitting needing, you know, psychological you know, assistance and self-care. How often have you heard, you know, you get the you get the message that, well, you're selfish. You're you're thinking about yourself, but you know, you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first, right? Uh, greed. I, I believe greed needs to return to being one of the seven deadly sins. It needs to be taboo, and we do have to strive to know ourselves because that's such an important thing. And there's so many ways to do that. I mean, it was even written on ancient temple walls, you know, the, at the healing centers, know thyself. Um, because if you, you know, you know what your shortcomings are, then you don't go walk into the minefield, you know? You, you know what you have to heal about yourself. Um, strive to vibrate at a higher frequency. And, um, you know, I talked about that a little bit earlier. Goddess values, uh, the people who study ascension and vibration and frequency, say these values of the sacred feminine do help us vibrate on a higher frequency. Learn to be in the flow with the universe. Practice gratitude and appreciation. Recognize the interconnection of all things. You know, we, we aren't just a monolith unto ourselves. And, you know, social justice. How important is social justice? And, you know, I'm sure you know people who believe all they need to do is pray. Or they can be neutral. Or they can be apolitical. Well, my answer to that is, I think, the next slide. Martha Gellhorn said, um, if you're not interested in politics, she said, people often say with pride, I'm not interested in politics. They might as well say, I'm not interested in my standard of living my health, my job, my rights, my freedoms, my future, or any future. If we mean to keep any control over our world and lives, we must be interested in politics. Mm -hmm. yeah. nice. And what better time to be talking about that than yeah, today? Exactly. And I didn't even plan it that way. <laughs> um, so, you know, I want to conclude with two statements. Uh, this first one is from a, a wonderful series of books out there called the Girl Guide Books, Girl Guide Books. 
And um, they have a new book coming out called Wounded Feminine, Grieving with Goddess. Mm -hmm. And there's a quote that they have in there that I just loved and I wanted to share with you. When state and religion collude to cement masculine power and undermine and control women, it makes sense to look to a spiritual age before patriarchy even existed where g the goddess held the power. Here the energy is compassionate, fierce and gentle, empowering and nurturing, creative and destructive, honoring every aspect of the feminine. Patriarchy's relentless denial of emotion stems from the fear of personal growth. Toxic masculinity stole our tears, mm -hmm. impeded our healing, and denied our wounded feminine in both men and women. We must reclaim, reframe, and contextualize the grief space so we feel our feelings free of shame. We can tell our stories, we can speak our truth, and then let it go. Then when we're ready, we can move on, knowing we're connected to a powerful and wise female lineage and support network. And, um, oh yeah, so this, the second statement was actually Martha here. So, um, we have an hour left, and um, I was going to um, do a, a domination versus partnership exercise with you, if, if you'll indulge me here. Um, can everybody maybe grab a partner? You know, stand up. Stand up. Yes. Partner. Can I be my partner? Is is there enough enough people over here to take a partner? Who do you want to come be my partner? Come up front. Come be my partner. Does everybody have a partner? Look, you know, look at the person next to you. Say hi. And Okay. So you need a partner. Who else needs a partner? You two. So you are two, uh, two groups. You two can be a group. Is there an extra person on the back row? Okay. Can you be a partner? We, okay. All right. She needs a partner. Okay. So this, this is kind of a silly little game, but I think it makes the point. You know, it's the idea of domination versus partnership or collaboration, right? So I want you to face your partner and touch hands. Okay? Okay, everybody ready? Okay, so first we're going to experience domination, right? So you look at that person across from you, and you know what? It's them or you. So, how does that feel? How does that feel? Don't be shy. How does that feel? Right? Okay? Yeah, maybe so. That's the point. That's the point, right? Is this like she my almost so killed it. Say. Well, you know, <laughs> that's kind of the point, right? Uh, it could, it could be that extreme. Uh, All right. So now we're gonna now we're gonna do the uh, we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna do the partnership collaboration and go back to your partner. <laughs> and you're gonna go back to your partner. And you're going to look in their eyes and you're going to smile. And you know you're going to create a win. You know you're going in. You're going to create a win-win situation because this isn't about winners and losers anymore. This is about winning. And you know what? Exactly. You got it. You can dance. Do you feel the difference in your body? Okay? Okay, so look, I know, I know we got a laugh out of the domination, but you, you get my point, right? Domination versus collaboration. Go ahead, sit down. You got us all out of our comfort zone. I got too much practice so, I don't have my camera. All right, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to have a little bit of Q&A. 
I can't swear I'll know the right answer, but I'll try. And, um, and if there's enough time, we're going to do a little meditation before we leave. And again, if anybody's interested, there's books, there's the email list. Okay? And I would invite any of the women. We haven't opened up to men yet. We will eventually. But I invite any of the women here to come to our Grants Pass Women's Circles on the second and fourth Wednesday at a place called Serendipity uh, at 6 o'clock. So uh, open invitation. Tell your friends. Um, so any questions, any comments, any thoughts? I have a question, Karen. Um, I'm really curious about, you know, when you said you grew up in New Orleans and you grew up Catholic, I, I grew up Catholic, so I know what that's like. When, how, when was the first moment, do you remember the first moment when you just, you know, made a decision to question? Yep. You know, you um, I think the answer is two or threefold. Um, I was really taken by the nuns at my school. There was something about that sisterhood, mm -hmm. you know. I used to actually go to church after school and pray because I thought I wanted to be a nun. Um, I think that there was that. Also, my family wasn't um, fundamentalist. You know, religion never mm -hmm. really got its hooks in me. Um, I was interested in metaphysics and ancient cultures. You know, you'd find me looking at books of Egypt, you know, instead of maybe what other kids were looking at. So I didn't, I guess you could say I didn't have, it, you know, I didn't have yeah. religion forced on yeah. me. Um, yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. probably my best answer. But I didn't know anything about God, <coughs> mm -hmm. you know, until I left Louisiana. My husband and I moved to California. And um, that's when I discovered the feminine face of God. And that's a whole story. <laughs> but tell us. Well, when I th <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, but what, okay. let when him I ask think this question. Of masculine and feminine, I think that exists in everybody. Yeah. It's not just women and it's not just men. And to talk about it as just a woman's issue is not complete mm -hmm. because the man has the feminine in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And the feminine has been driven out of man. Yes. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. a boy doesn't cry. Mm -hmm. You know, a boy doesn't say nice things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just not. So they don't to me, they don't, yeah. mm -hmm. I think it should be taught more men and women, not just women. Because yeah. When you talk about it as only women, you're creating separation. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. And separation and is what our problem is in yeah, life. Yeah. Is separation. Well, you know, it should be the integration. You know, I said when when I saw the number of men coming in here, I said to my friend Marie, "Look at the men." <laughs> you know, normally this is not the norm. You know, men generally don't come to listen to this kind of thing. Um, so you were an exception, sir. Thank you. Well, I live with a psychologist. <laughs> and I was very, and I was very lucky. My my husband was raised by women, and he grew up respecting women. You know, yeah. so I guess that's why we've lasted forty years. You know, and we, we were equals, but everybody doesn't. And I think it's you know it's that pendulum idea. You know, women have to know what they've lost. Men have to know. And, what they've and men lost. have to know as so well. It's not just one. Yeah. I agree with you. Okay, I don't so disagree. I just, uh, yeah, I don't disagree. But I, more men need to be open to the topic, and right. women are open to it, and right. not a lot of men are, well, unfortunately. If women yeah. are open to it, and men aren't, why aren't you working with men? Because they don't show up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe there should be a way to get them. There are men. We'd, that, we'd need men to. There are men you know, that will show up. I yes. have many men friends. Maybe in Ashland, but not in New Orleans. Make... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Um, Reverend Steph, you yeah. asked. I wanted to hear your story of how you came across the goddess in California. Um, so uh, Roy and I moved to um, to Los Angeles, and I can't tell you for sure at this point because this was back in the very early 90s, I guess, uh, I, there's this group called the Learning Annex that gave all sorts of classes from taxes to dance. And somebody gave a class on the goddess. And um, it turned out to be, you know, as I look back on it now, it was a fluff class. But it cracked the door open and made me curious. And you know that old saying, when the student's ready, the teacher appears? Well, and suddenly I was just inundated with goddess-oriented stuff. And uh, it was a slippery slope from that point. You know, I, 
I caught on pretty early that this could change the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was angry. I was so angry because I thought, how in the heck was this? I, I, here I was, 30 years old, finding about it, out about it for the first time. Why? You know, why did it take so long? And all my friends that are still living in New Orleans, they don't know, they still don't know anything about it. And maybe don't even care about it because they don't really understand the importance of the societal shift, you know, we have to make. So yeah, one thing led to another. Uh, Roy and I loved uh, travel and history, so we married our passion of the sacred feminine with history and our desire to travel. Um, I, you know, as the universe puts the pieces of the puzzle together, I was a part-time travel agent so we could travel cheap. And we started, you know, traveling to all of these sacred places of goddess. And I have to tell you, standing in places where goddess was revered for thousands of years changed my life. I mean, when we think about the religion of um, Demeter and Persephone, that was a 2,000-year-old religion. That wasn't just a fly-by-night worship, you know? So, yeah, when I really started to realize, and, um, do we have... Have all of these made it back? I think there's only two there. I, is there one more? Oh, it's over there, Karen. Okay, Somebody thank you. Um, you know, when I started to realize how ancient goddess was, um, you know, it, I, I was just determined to make it my mission to teach other women and men um, what I had just discovered because I felt like it was so profound and um, you know, and then when I made the connection to social justice, it wasn't just about women. It's about changing our politics and patriarchy and capitalism and all of that. Um, so that we manifest a new normal in the world. We, you know, we evolve as humans and mm -hmm. stop doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of the short version. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What did you say, how did you word it when you said we, we had something with the Trump, administra Trump administration? Since well, there's so much. I <laughs> <laughs> But there was some word you used. I couldn't. I think toxic much. masculinity. Uh, well, there's that. But, uh, <laughs> 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 domination. Maybe domination. That too. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I think it was dominionism. Dominion. Dominion. Oh, dominionism. Yeah. Dominionism oh, yeah, that's is, is, is a form of Christianity. They have the seven mountains mandates. Those seven mountains are different parts of society they want to control. The media, entertainment, corporations, religion. They want to get in there. It's kind of like Project 2025 to a certain extent. They want to get in there and put their Bible twist on everything, mm -hmm. and Mike Pence was one. Mm -hmm. uh, some oh, of the yeah. other people in Trump's cabinet were dominionist. Mm -hmm. oh. Go home and look up dominionist. They Thanks. basically, it's, um, you know, it, it's Project 25. They yes. want to make the United States a in their Christian image. Yeah, they right. want to make the Heritage. Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know. Heritage Foundation Heritage. probably has a lot of dominionists in it. Yeah, in it. yeah. I, yeah. Ne I never even knew that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, go please go home. Uh, you know, read Christ about Christian nationalism. Read about dominionism. It all goes hand in hand. Somebody back there had a hand up. Before. I had a hand up, and I hope I don't offend anybody here. But when you work in a patriarchal society, how do you survive? <laughs> we endure. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to endure, and I I const and I am one that constantly sticks my hand out. And I have not yet stopped sticking my hand out. Don't what do you mean by sticking your hand out? out? <laughs> well, that's what you used about training. Oh, reaching. 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 Yeah. Sticking my yeah. hand out. Yeah. Yeah. Reaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and sticking you know your what? hand out. And, yeah. and you just keep getting your head cut. Oh, yeah. Oh, so you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know what? When um, e women or men, women, like you said, can be patriarchal, oh, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. I've been pointed um, at a lot. Women or men. Um, because I, I believe in justice, social justice, equal rights across the board, not just for people that are um, doing the job at a higher hierarchy. I think everybody should be treated with respect dignity. and courtesy and dignity and compassion. Yep. And um, when I do my job and I feel like I'm ex exempting these qualities, 
um, I get told that I'm not. And it's a way to control me. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, we rationalize it. I, I totally get um, what you mean. You know, I had an employer uh, to keep the roof over my head and the paycheck. Um, I did what I was told, and I didn't like who I had to be. Right. Uh, so I compartmentalized who I had to be at my job. Yeah, to, I'm not doing that anymore. She stopped. Well, that's it's great. That's hard. great. And, you know, we all have to start looking for exit strategies. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? But first, but we constant, have to recognize It's a constant it. exit strategy. Why do I got to constantly be exiting? Well, you know what? You may get to the point where, uh, you know, maybe you'll start your own business. Maybe you'll... <laughs> Maybe you'll work for a not-for-profit, you know, um, you'll work for, for, work for an organization that has better, it's you know, morality like, oh and, and, you know, it's, money isn't the common But the why do we have to live in a society that doesn't get it? Karen, can I say something? Sure. I think, you know, I can't, I can only change me. I cannot change anything around me. Exactly. And I've been in corporate America since I was a young woman. And, you know, I dealt with a lot of women. I, I remember one time, I come from Boston, and I was looking for a job after I had my daughter, and I went to a headhunter, and I said, I, I don't want to go on an interview with a woman. I don't want to work <laughs> oh, for a yeah, woman. Absolutely. Because I found the women to be worse, worse than, the than the men. But that's because this was in the, this was in the 80s, the yeah. late 80s, and women were vying for a place, you know, right. at, at, at the table, people. right? So what I've learned over the years, and even still, I worked at a nonprofit right here in Ashland, and I'll tell you, I, I, I endured patriarchy in the women at that organization. Yeah. And so I have to just be as centered as I possibly can in my life and grow spiritually and become part of communities that nurture me and feed me and educate me and just grow you know, and evolve and become more centered and what I have found, of course, I'm 65 and I, I can retire now, but that stuff falls away. I'm 63. Yeah, so and that. So I understand what you're saying, but that is not that is not changing. It is though. It, it is it's, when I when we when we it's, change our. It's a turtle pace. I want more of a rabbit pace. Well, <laughs> but, but look, change doesn't happen that way, unfortunately. We are making a difference. We are making a difference. Yeah. No, I think we are making, look, you think about, I mean, really, you think about our mothers and our grandmothers, right? Mm -hmm. um, my mother knew nothing about any of this, right? And her mother knew even less. Right. We, we are educating ourselves, we're more aware, mm -hmm. um, we're about to have a, a woman, woman president. president. Yeah. 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 Um, there's, there's lots of good things happening yep. alongside the stuff that still has to mm -hmm. change, but we have to demand that it change. If you have a choice between maybe an employer where you're going to make more money, but maybe you're going to have to do questionable things, or maybe you work for an employer that, uh, I don't know, <laughs> can you afford to take a little bit less, but have some peace of mind and not hate yourself? Yeah. I mean, you know, we just, we have to, because look, this can be in our families too. Yeah. This isn't just the workplace. Yeah. This is society, culture, family, mm -hmm. friends. Right. You know, so uh, we can't bite it all off at once. We got to choose our battles mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe it's baby steps, but just being aware of it is, I think, a big star. It's a gift. I think that, I think the key is, and, and we, I have a couple different nonprofits um, that are private nonprofits, and I want Laura to come work with us. But uh, we go around the world into conflict war zones and natural disaster areas, and people say, "Why do you do it?" Like you know, and it's like because you can. Mm -hmm. If you if you have the ability to make a change and decide not to, then shame on you. Yeah. Because everyone looks at it as being. It's over there. I don't see it. Or somebody else's it's problem. It's somebody else's problem. Non, non complacent And so mm -hmm. I think that when you live your life truly and you live it fully, and and I always tell people, I'm not a survivor. I'm a thriver. Yeah. You know, I've been through some really extreme things because of the work I do, and I always come back. And it's because I believe in what I'm doing. I believe it's important. And I think that when you live your life that way and you believe in it, that you, that's how people educate, because they get drawn to that energy. People mm -hmm. like, 
I want part of that. I want to be that. Yeah. And so you can change more people by living your life fully and out loud. Yeah. And, and you know, it doesn't have to be big things. No, no, it doesn't. I mean, it can start with little things. Say, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, uh, there's an elderly man or woman in your apartment complex. You know, you know Social Security barely makes it till the end right. of the month, right? right? Maybe show up with a casserole. Right. Or maybe she still lives in a house, but she can't bend over and weed her garden. Right. Weed her garden for her. Right. Go pick up her mail. Mm -hmm. Little things like that, little kindnesses, right. puts mm -hmm. that energy into the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it, it builds, yep. you know? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thoughts? Questions? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I, I thought we would do maybe. Do y'all do y'all want to do a little meditation? Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Um, we have we have time. Um, so can we dim the lights? Yeah. We can. So let's all settle into a comfortable position. Begin to be aware of your breath. At your own pace, take some really deep breaths. Feel the breath filling your diaphragm slowly, then release it slowly. As you breathe in, let anything besides this moment and this meditation fall away. Let the outside world slip away. Breathe in ease and comfort. Breathe out anything that does not serve your highest good. As you breathe in, think about what your connection to the divine or your higher self feels like. Breathe out. Do that one more time. See yourself filled with divine guidance as a golden glow filters down from the crown of your head, through your body, and to your toes. Breathe in once more in certainty or openness that you are in sync with the flow of good. As you keep your eyes closed or in soft focus, you begin to notice the setting you're in. You hear music reminiscent of a carnival or circus in the background. You feel a weight on your back and you feel you're going in slow circles round and round. Every time you make a circle, you see the same faces pass you by. You notice you're also moving up and down slowly. Up and down. In the distance, you see a beautiful green pasture, white fluffy clouds, and a beautiful mountain landscape. You want to be there but you're here instead with this weight on your back going round and round and up and down. But you decide to resist. You take a step forward, then another and another, and you find you can move. You can get off this merry-go-round and run Run for the hills and the green pasture in the distance, so you do. You feel really amazing as your feet leave the concrete jungle and come to the soft green grass and fertile soil beneath. That weight is now lifted off your back and you're unfettered, unbridled, able to run and sun without being tethered to that other world. You go within and realize you're going from being tamed to reclaiming your wildness, your freedom, your own sovereignty. 
you are queen or king of your destiny and path ahead. And you love calling the shots instead of that wheel you were stuck on. As you're walking through the meadow of tall green grasses, enjoying the feeling of the open spaces, you notice a group you identify with being like you up ahead. You slowly approach and try to feel the vibe. Yes, they might be, could be your tribe, your herd. As you get closer, you think you see one of them raise a head and step forward in recognition of you. You're being called. You're being called by name. You try to remember, do I have a name? Did that captivity I just escaped deprive me of my memories of my true name, my wild and free name? Yes, I think so. You keep coming closer to the herd so you can hear more easily. What are they calling to you? What is that name, your name? Reclaim now that wild name that once was yours or is now. Listen, allow yourself to hear. You keep coming closer to the herd so you can hear more clearly and you release a huge sigh. Yes, yes, you have it now. You know your wild name and you make a commitment to yourself to never forget it because with the lapse of memory of your name, you also forgot your authentic self your autonomy, your power. You let yourself run with your herd now. You return to your power to be independent and resilient, to run with your tribe or when you choose to stand alone. But never again will you be on that merry-go-round in captivity going nowhere, and with that weight on your back. Say your wild name to yourself again, and again, and a third time. If you didn't hear it yet, you will. Claim a name for yourself. Vow to never forget your name and your wild and untamed nature. Hold on to it. It will serve you well as you return to your power. When you're ready, come back to this space. Be aware of your breath once again. Wiggle your toes and fingers. Gently open your eyes and look around the room. Look at the faces of the other people here. Each a member of your tribe, a member of your herd. Like you, a colorful and authentic strand that weaves together as one with you to create a beautiful tapestry of agency and a return to your own power. So that was inspired by uh, one of the goddess rituals we did recently. That was one of the meditations I wrote and read there. And I was thinking, you know, I didn't answer um, in the obvious way when you said, what can we do? I mean, in my opinion, unless we have survival issues, our total focus needs to be 
getting Kamala Harris elected president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, that's our path to freedom instead of our path to more repression. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether some of you know, but the Supreme Court used the writings and thoughts of men from the 1200s to the 1600s to take away Roe v. Wade. Yes, I knew that. So, anyway. Karen, I, yeah. I think that, um, you know, I see like women gathering together in a way they never have before. Like, in, even nationally, there's Emily's List, you know, where powerful women are are supporting women at the local levels to, you know, to run for office and things like that. And I really do think the Dalai Lama was right, you know, that, you know, it is a, it's a fact that Western women are more educated, you know, than other parts of the world. And I know from my education, I took women's studies, gender studies, queer studies, all those things that enlightened me, sociology, social, you know, I was a sociology minor. and. Um, and the more that we're educated and we realize what's happened to us, not just women, but you know, our whole society or our world, but in particular women, yeah, I want, you know, I, I care about, I have a son that I love, you know, that I love more than anything and he's just such a wonderful human being. But I think it's okay for us as women to put the energy into our communities at this time. And like you said, you know, we're, and a lot of times I was told when I was in the Christian religion that it was my responsibility to care for my husband or to enlighten my husband or, you know, whatever. No, I'm here to enlighten myself and to evolve myself. And men have that same opportunity. Yeah. You know, I, it's not my job. Yeah. you know, to teach men or to bring men. It's, it's their, you know, responsibility to step up and step out like we are. Well, you know. and I would recommend the film um, that I had the opportunity to be a little part of, Fem Women Healing the World. Um, so can you say that again? Fem Women Healing the World. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it was really, you know, it's, I, I've said a couple times it's interesting how the universe works. I was at a showing of the film before it was actually finished and ready to be, um, you know, put out there into the world. And he didn't have anything in it about goddess and patriarchy. You know, we had Jean Houston and all of these wonderful people, Rianne Eisler and women from all around the globe. And I said, Emmanuel, that was producer, I said, but you forgot goddess, you forgot the sacred feminine. And, um, and so he did, he added it to the front of the film mm -hmm. and I got to have a little snippet in it. So, um, <laughs> but it's, a, it's really a great educational tool as is Dale Allen's film we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. um, which is, um, you know, right, thank you so much. And you know what, I do think women are getting to, I mean, I remember when I first came up in this, Phyllis Chesler's book, Women's Inhumanity to Women, was out. And I think women are starting to learn how to collaborate more than compete. Yeah, they are. I think that's another yeah. thing that is slowly yeah. changing, mm -hmm. you know. That's what's happening. Yeah. So I want to close with this poem. And, uh, and then, you know, if you have to go, thank you for coming. Uh, if you want to chat or look at books, you can do any of that, you know, or like I said, put your name on the email list. Um, but I wanted to close with this poem called Self Love, because as Marie said, it, it starts with us, right? It starts with ourselves. Acknowledge your gifts, notice your beauty. Don't stand in traps that keep you small. Shake hands with your critic, and then introduce her to your beloved self. There are floods of love within you that are simply waiting for the dam of self-judgment to be broken, for the walls built of your own harsh thoughts to come crumbling down. You deserve to know the tenderness of your own magnificent heart. Then you come to know my beautiful one that your brilliant capacity to love the world rests upon how much you love yourself. <coughs> mm -hmm. And that's um, uh, called A Poem by Flying by Deborah Ann Quibble. So thank you guys for coming. Thank the center for having me. And um, I appreciate you listening. Thank you.